Philly landlords. Welcome to Landlords Connect Philadelphia edition. This is our fourth episode, and this is um, becoming the number one resource for becoming a successful landlord in the Philadelphia area. Um, please join us if you haven't already uh, done so on the Facebook group, Philadelphia Landlords Connect where you'll uh, join other landlords and get to know other people in the Philadelphia area and learn a lot from one another, as well as uh, get updates on these podcasts and YouTube videos and, and everything you need to know about being a landlord in Philadelphia. It's a great resource and we got a great group of people there. So it's Philadelphia Landlords Connect on Facebook. And we'll also have that in the show notes, as well as information about the podcast and our guests today. Um, today's podcast is about minimizing maintenance and turnover costs, something that everybody needs to know about <laughs> um, and, and a sore point um, for, for all of us, especially lately with all of the inflation. Um, we have the perfect guest to help us figure that out. This is a guy who, had I met him six years ago when I got started in Philadelphia, um, I think I would have saved a lot of money and a whole lot of headaches. <laughs> um, we, uh, I, so <laughs> something that I wanted to, to share with bef before I introduce him, um, just that I talk to a lot of investors all the time and and I help people uh, analyze deals and I see the same things over and over. I see the spreadsheet that looks really nice with very, very tempting ROI um, for say a property that's 80 years old, 100 years old, whatever, you know, those properties. And the investor is thinking, wow, it's got new flooring, fresh new paint, this place looks great. I'm gonna put a tenant in here and then I'm gonna make my money. And the spreadsheet is gonna do its thing. Um, but it, it very often doesn't really go that way. Um, even the minor stuff can really have an impact. So think about a unit that gets a thousand dollars a month and now needs a new stack or a new furnace, or even just a new tub faucet that then turns into a new diverter and then some tile repair and then some, sh some sheet rock and, uh, goes on and on, and suddenly you find that your one thousand dollars a month isn't there anymore. Um, so that's why we're doing this podcast, and that's why I invited Rich O'Neill, the founder of Fleming Project Management, to talk to us today about this important subject. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about Rich before we turn it over to him. Rich started in real estate in 2016 after quitting his W-2 job to start building a real estate portfolio. Over the next four years, he acquired and renovated 40 units with a total value of over $4 million. Today, he continues to buy real estate, but has shifted his focus to his general contracting business that works exclusively with investors. This is really unique stuff here to renovate their rental and flip pro properties to maximize long-term yield. A big part of, of that is what we're talking about today, which is bulletproofing your rental property during the initial renovation to save time, headaches, and money on regular maintenance, expenses, turnover costs, and capital improvements throughout the ownership of the property. I'm sure everything I just said talks to all of you out there and that you're eagerly awaiting to hear from Rich. So let me turn it over to Rich. Um, just could you just tell us a bit about yourself and how you ended up doing this uh, in Philadelphia? Yeah, so um, I grew up in construction. My dad had a uh, home building company growing up. And as early as probably 10 years old, I was sweeping basements and garages and all sorts of fun stuff like that. And we live in, I grew up in what you could probably consider a, a live-in flip. Some people mm -hmm. talk about we were always doing something on that house. It was a 1920s um, Victorian style house out in the suburbs and there's always something going on. So I learned a lot about both renovation and new construction uh, doing that. Then when I went to school, I uh, went to college, finance was one of my favorite subjects. So the perfect marriage of the two was real estate investing. Um, I came back to the Philly area after, after going to school and uh, kind of honed in on, I, I had a, like, like Cheryl said, I had a W-2 job for a couple of years and um, 
but while I was there, I kind of honed in on uh, the Delaware County market uh, for where I wanted to invest and ended up leaving my job and going to buy my first property, did most of the work myself on that first one. Then the next one, I hired a couple of subs. The third one, I general contracted the whole thing and the rest is kind of history. Um, so, so it's a, it yeah. sounds rich, like you kind of went through what what a lot of us landlords went went through, you know, starting to to buy properties and maybe not really even knowing before that, you know, what what was uh, in store for you. And then you yeah. discovered <laughs> what what that's like. Um, but you took it to another level and, you know, recognize the pain point that a lot of us have and 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 trying to help investors resolve that and focused on investors in in particular as a as opposed to home renovations which is right. very very different business that a lot of people don't really understand well what what is the difference a home is a home um could you talk to landlords a, a bit about what's the difference um between uh, a renovation for a uh, for a rental as opposed to what someone does in their own home um, to make it nicer or more livable? Yep, yeah. So we intentionally went specifically with investors because A, I can add some additional value there, but uh, it's also clearly, like you said, a different, it's a different type of renovation. We can more or less do the same thing over and over and over and over again and get really good at that because most of the time it's gonna be the same thing. We're always looking for uh, your most durable products because our client isn't necessarily gonna be spending all of their free time in this property. So when you're doing a renovation on your own home, you're really concerned about which shade of white you're putting in or you know which countertop, you're gonna to wanna to go pick out the slab and you're gonna want it to be absolutely perfect aesthetically. But you're not as concerned about the durability of those products because you know that you're going to take care of it. And if something goes wrong, it comes out of your pocket. So you're not going to be carelessly using the materials that are in your in your house. Whereas your tenants, I hate to break it to you, don't really care about your property, right? You might think that you do all the best screening in the world and you do all these things and that's great. But at the end of the day, they have very little incentive to take care of your property. So the best way to prevent costs, headaches, everything associated with tenant damage is to get out ahead of it. Maybe spend a little bit more on the laminate flooring versus carpet throughout the upstairs, or um, you know, put on a uh, put on a silicone roof coating on your flat roof so that your roof is going to last a little bit longer. Some things like that can help to reduce all of those maintenance costs. Uh, capital expenditures later and basically things that can ruin your ROI. So what what are some of the typical things you see from owners of misunderstandings they have about what they should or shouldn't do in, in a rental property? So most of the time, they're too focused on the aesthetic of, of what they're looking at in the house. They're too focused on the paint color. They're too focused on which type of cabinet they're putting in um, or the color of the flooring. Right. At the end of the day, we want to we want to pay the most attention to uh, the things that are going to make this thing perform without needing all this damage. So the big thing I see a lot is people want to go in and they want to tile the whole bathroom and they want it floor to ceiling and they want it to just look absolutely beautiful. But in order to pay for that, they don't want to replace all the knob and tube wiring or they don't want to go in and preemptively replace the stack that nine times out of 10 is cracked. Um, you might just not know it yet. So, you know, they skimp on some of these, uh, some of these bigger ticket items that could come and bite in later. And I know really well about that because I was that guy, right? My first few renovations, I pinched my pennies and didn't want to do any of that work. And those units, while they still do fairly well for me, I've had to go back in while a tenant's in place and replace the wiring, replace the stack. And it is way more expensive to do that when the tenant's in place, especially if it's going to be something like rewiring. Because right. um, usually for that, you've got to go put the tenant up in a, in a, in a hotel for a couple of days. And that gets that gets outrageous. So, but before we jump into the this amazing list that you've created, I just one of the things that uh, a lot of people I think don't understand is um 
how to dis even decide from the very beginning of what they need to do. And like, like you're talking about the, um, you know, different things about electric roofing, um, plumbing, all the stuff that not the average investor or the average landlord doesn't have uh, knowledge about all of these right. different aspects of, of the structure and, and of a, of, of a house or, a, or a building. Um, what would you recommend people do in order to make those decisions? I mean, when I first started, for example, I was, you know, walked into a house and just got the overall sense like, oh, this is a nice house or this is a trashed house or or whatever yeah. and made my decisions based on on a gut instinct that sometimes it, it was quite often it was it was right, but made some some big costly mistakes. So how do we avoid that? So I'd say there's probably three things that play into this. The first and probably most important is the buy. And one of the big mistakes I see a lot of people make is they go into this quote grandma special, right? Mm -hmm. We've all seen this property that, you know, it's got some kind of funky coloring and, you know, the floors are maybe a parquet flooring or something, uh, but it looks clean. Like it's broom swept and, you know, it doesn't look bad. Well, what we don't realize or what, what a lot of people don't pay attention to is that maybe that's a 1920s, 1930s, maybe even 1940s house. And they walk into it and it looks and feels good. So they pay a lot of money for it. And then when they go to do the rehab, they're going to, if they have a good contractor, they're going to notice that, hey, there's not tube wiring in here or all of your plumbing is cast iron and it's probably going to break at some point. And now they don't have any money left to go and fix those things. So they skip it. And then a tenant moves in, they plug in a hundred different things into one circuit on that knob and tube. And then the whole wiring system starts going on a fritz. Wow. Okay. So I often tell my clients, if it looks good, look closer. Because that might mean take off a plate cover and look inside of the outlet or the switch and see if you only see two wires coming into that box. Chances are, if you only see two wires, or if you look around and you look at the outlets and there's only the two prongs, not the third one on the bottom, chances are that's knob and tube wiring. And that's not a good thing. If it's if it's ungrounded, that's also a problem because you can have other issues electrically related that we don't have to get into too deeply. But um, look closer at those properties because often those are the hardest ones to renovate because you're trying to salvage everything and it it just it ultimately ends up being cheaper to gut the whole thing and now you don't have any money to do that okay i That's... would prefer i prefer to go into a gutted house with nothing in there unless it's fire damaged that's a different story but i'd rather go into a gutted house and start from scratch than a clean one cuz usually you can get a better deal on that gutted one cuz everyone's scared of it Okay, that's that's a really great tip. And and then would would you advise that people who don't under you know there's plenty of us who wouldn't be able to take that uh, outlet apart and 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 look right. and they wouldn't feel comfortable doing that um, that they go in with a contractor or yes. with the, maybe with with your team and sure. do an initial scope before they even make the decision about whether this is the right property for them. Yeah, absolutely. So um, that was going to be number two is use experts. Um, we like to consider ourselves experts. We do these all day, every day. So we know what we're looking for in these Philly, especially Philly row homes. That's our bread and butter. Um, so we can go in and tell you, yes, there's knob and tube here. And the scary thing about knob and tube is that there was a significant amount of time in like the 80s, early 90s, even in the 70s, where uh, it was legal to go in and anything that you see, they would go and swap it out with Romex or a newer wire and they would junction it in. So you still have the knob and tube in the walls, but everything that you could see was newer wiring. So it looks like you've got newer wiring in the building, but you might still have knob and tube up in the ceiling and the walls and things like that. Um, so you really have to look closely. Um, using a Using an expert like a contractor or a building inspector even uh, can can really help save your bacon on this. Um, I like to go in and, and tell the inspector or tell clients to tell their inspector that, you know, I'm looking for uh, things that might bite me later. And 
you know, those are the things. Knob and tube, cast iron plumbing, um, very dated HVAC systems, uh, foundation issues, things like that. And then, of course, uh, building inspectors are always kind of notoriously dramatic. They want to show you everything and they want it to all be a really big deal. You got to use your judgment on what's actually a good deal. Maybe get a second opinion. Right. Give the give the inspection report to the contractor and say what of this is really important. Right. Uh, but leverage those experts, especially if you don't know uh, what you're doing and if you don't have the experience. Yeah. Those um, for for a novice, getting those inspection reports can be a very um, intimidating and scary thing. And then when once you start to understand that, then then yeah. you know you know how to read in between the lines. Um, another thing the is the amount of times, the amount of times I've had to talk someone off the ledge from a building inspection <laughs> is like, I can't count them. So right. take it with a grain of salt, but right. it's good information. Right. Yeah. I can imagine. And, and another thing is that, uh, getting a contractor, you know, if you're going to take it, con the, the same contractor that's going to do the work is coming in to do the scope. It's a little bit of a conflict of interest. Um, he's going to be looking at the things that he knows how to do or that he knows how to charge a lot for, yep. or it's, uh, unless it's somebody, you know, really well, you've been working with them and you trust, then you have to, to think whether it's the right person to help you scope out the project and really understand what, what you're facing in, in, in that, uh, purchase. Yeah. Um, one thing just, this is, I, I get a question all the time of like, how do I choose a good contractor? One thing when it comes to what you said specifically is if they are giving you a scope and they're talking you through some of the things and everything is terrible, you need to basically tear down the building. That's probably not the right contractor, right? They, if they're going to be on your side, they should be pointing out, Hey, we don't need to do this or this looks fine. We should be okay with this. Let's take that out of the scope because, you know, you don't want someone that's just going to come in and chart and, and want to do everything and not budge on it and put you into a position where you feel like you don't have any choices. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you for that. Yeah. So, so um, I want to jump into this uh, list that you created, which you called the yeah. bulletproof rental checklist. I love the name and that's what we're all looking for. Bullet bulletproofing our business. Uh, you can never do it 100% obviously. Right. But if you look at things in a, a methodical way, in a professional way, and you know, like the things we were talking about before, not focus on the aesthetics, but but focus more on the um, uh, preventative maintenance and yeah. the 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 life the the um, uh, life cycle of the different things that 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 you do and. Um, pay attention to, to Rich's list, you can, you, you, you can really, uh, add to your bottom line and reduce your headaches and, right. um, and, <clears throat> and, and really change your business. So, um, I'm not savvy enough yet to show it on the, on the screen, but we'll share it in the, in the show notes as well. Rich has been generous enough to, to create this, this list and I want him to go through it. Um, there are a lot of things actually that surprised me on here. Um, sure. And I'll let you explain it. So it starts, the, the the first subject is avoiding water issues. I know that well. I know water is our enemy. So yep. can you talk a bit about that? Yeah. And that's why it's the first thing on there is water is often the most nagging thing. Um, even a little drip can turn into really big problems. Um, so during a renovation, we, we focus a lot on the plumbing system and any other, and really the building envelope to make sure that water doesn't become an issue. Uh, the amount of roofs I've had to deal with in my own rentals are, are terrible. So just a couple of things that, that we like to do, um, not apparently not a lot of people know this. I, I kind of always thought this was a given, but you can actually stick a camera down your sewer system and look for cracks and leaks. Um, or the other problem can be, which I had to learn this the hard way again, a, a sewer system always has to pitch toward the sewer system. And if there's not enough of that pitch, you can get water settling in the pipe somewhere. And if the water isn't constantly moving, then it's gonna slow down any other water that comes through which is gonna to collect toilet paper, which is gonna collect solids. And that's ultimately what's gonna uh, cause a, a backup. So 
that's something we're looking for when we run a camera through the system. So that's a relatively inexpensive thing to do at the beginning. It's usually around $250, uh, $250, $300. And uh, that, can, that can prevent a lot of issues. The other thing that can do is you can now, you can get the recording from that video and you can actually share it with your future tenants and say, look, this, this is what the camera or this is what the sewer system looked like before you moved in. It is perfectly, it is perfectly good right now. If there are issues, those issues are on you and you need to call a plumber. And so, do, do sometimes yeah. people get, if, if you do that before a purchase, then you can, and you see that there's a problem, then you can try to get you a price negotiate. reduction. Yeah. 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 Okay. Now they may not want you to do that. It, depending on how you structure the deal, uh, it might be a wholesaler and they might say, yeah, you can get the inspection, but we're not changing the price. And sometimes that's just something you have to deal with. Um, it can absolutely affect the negotiation, but it's definitely something I like to do regardless of how we're purchasing it, because that lets me know I need to fix this, this section of the, of the plumbing or the whole system is, is in bad shape. We should take care of this now. Um, <clears throat> so that's one of the big ones. Uh, one other thing that we like to do is for whatever reason, tenants love throwing things under sinks, right? I don't know how they do this, but they always crack that little cheap plastic uh, P-trap that's underneath of the sink. So that's what every contractor seems to want to put in because it's simple to work with, it's easy, um, and it's cheap. So what we've started doing is actually putting really hard, durable uh, PVC traps in, Schedule 40 PVC traps, so that the only piece of that skinny plastic is the tailpiece uh, that's all the way up right under the sink. So that can help prevent cracking that that P-trap when tenants, for whatever reason, decide to throw something under there. I think what a lot of tenants end up doing is they get a small trash can, and that's kind of a common place to put the trash can. And you overfill the trash can because you don't feel like taking the bag out, so you stuff it in the cabinet, in the cabinet, you break that line without knowing it, and then all of a sudden you start doing dishes and water is all over the place. Okay. Now so, I know, now I know why I've had to replace so many P traps. <laughs> yep. Yep. So P traps are a pain. Um, and the beautiful thing about these schedule 40 ones is that they work exactly the same way. It's just a thicker material. You still have the screw fittings. You still have all those things so that you can take the, uh, the trap off for clean outs for anything else. Uh, so those are, those are a really cheap little, change that can make a big difference. Um, there's a bunch more on here. I encourage you yeah. to go look, but one of the more unique ones uh, that we like to do is a hardwired dedicated dehumidifier that lives in the basement and it is plumbed right into the sewer system, or if that's not legal, it's plumbed right outside so that the thing is always running when there's more humidity than say 60%. And it's going to eliminate all of your... I shouldn't say all. It's going to eliminate most of your uh, mildew issues. We don't say the the other M word. But right. I was uh, I was very of proud of myself. Issues. I was very proud of myself when I saw this because I do this, and this was nothing yeah. anybody else told 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 us to do. We just came up with it on our own and started installing that in every in every house. Now, uh, yeah. The only risk is the tenants could turn it off because they don't want to pay the electric. So I just put stickers on there like, don't touch this. You know, it'll blow yeah. up if you touch it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And that's and that's one one thing you can even you can build a cage around it. You can literally cut the uh, cut the cord off and hardwire it into the building uh, mm -hmm. so that they don't want to touch it. Uh, it you can do a lot of things to make sure that that they don't do that. But uh, Again, it depends on how how far into that you want to go. Okay, uh, but I, that's one of the bigger challenges that I've ever had, especially in Philly. Is all of these all these buildings are built with fieldstone foundations, which are notorious for leaking. So I like to do that just as a way to keep humidity down, keep mildew down, keep complaints down. Okay, great, great, great tip. So let's move on to the the next um, topic: the avoid how to avoid maintenance issues. Um, I mean, this is a, a, such a such a sore point of like things that that come up that 
you know, the, the smallest things that you think like, why can't you just do that yourself? And tenants just don't know. I just, I recently put a post up where I showed that a tenant just needs to change a light bulb, but she yep. took the entire fixture off and said, well, there's no light bulb. There's only wires. And, yep. you know, to me, it's, it's pretty funny, but obviously she never changed the light bulb before. So right. we have and to now send, it's, now we have it's to send somebody. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And you can try and build them back for that. And you can try that, but that just gets into a big, long fight that honestly is more time and headache. Right. right? By the time I was, I was doing my 30th through 40th unit, I was at the point where I didn't want to talk to a tenant. I didn't want to deal with any of it. I, I just wanted it to be turnkey so that I didn't have to hear from anybody. Right. And I'm sure there are a lot of landlords here that are, that are in the same boat. So some of these things are not going to be aesthetically pleasing, which is kind of funny because in your own home, you would never do some of these things. But in our rental units, I like to do them because yeah, it might be a little bit of an eyesore, but it's going to save me a lot of headache and a lot of money later. So my biggest example of that, I like to put the big plastic discs on the wall behind the door because whenever someone opens the door, even if you've got a door stop, it still might if they slam it the wrong way, they're going to push that doorknob through the, through the drywall. Like I see that all of the time or the, the, uh, the doorstop breaks. If it's a spring one, they're easy to fall off all of these different things. They could just, they could break. So right. this makes it so that even if they slam that door open and there's no doorstop left, now it's not going to put a hole in the drywall. Right. And right. to you and and to you landlords who are saying, oh, but I got a security deposit. I'll just take it off the security deposit when they move. Your security deposit is not going to get you far. <laughs> no, nope. Yeah. Do this. Add, add up all of the things that are going to get broken uh, if you don't do some of these things. And it's gone very quickly. And at the same time, you're going to get into an argument about, oh, that doesn't cost that much or whatever. And it's it's not fun. So I'd rather get ahead of it. And if they're worried about the, you know, the look of one of those plastic discs, sorry, you're not going to be my tenant and that's okay. So that's one of them. Uh, LED light bulbs, I love doing in every fixture because I don't want to get a call about a light bulb, right? And now it's less of an issue because you can't, it's hard to get incandescent bulbs anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, but the CFLs kind of go out fairly quickly. Some of the other types of bulbs go out quickly. LEDs have 10,000 hour lifespans or something crazy like that. So, and they're not that much more expensive. So just put those in and it's, it's much less of a headache later. Um, actually, do I have it on the list? I don't have it on this list actually, but a bonus one for you is the sealed, um, the sealed smoke detectors, mm -hmm. the 10 year battery sealed smoke detectors. They might not actually last 10 years, but that's okay. Uh, it's at least going to last you five. And it's not going to chirp at you when, you know, when that battery dies every year and then the tenant takes the battery out and never replaces it. Right. right. And like P, if, for, for PHA, for example, if you, um, if, if you have uh, section eight tenants and when they come and inspect and almost inevitably they're not, they're not going to have changed the, right. the batteries or they just take the, the smoke detectors down. Um, but it's on you as the landlord you can charge the tenant back. And even in the inspection notes, it might yep. might say that it's the tenant responsibility, but you're not going to pass inspection unless those those things are working. And it's inevitable. Every inspection, you're going to have an issue. Exactly. And I don't know if I don't know if you saw this, but there was a fire in a PHA building recently. And apparently the some of the reports that I read were saying that several of the units had non-working smoke detectors. And the cause may have been that the tenants actually took the batteries out because they were tired of them chirping and people died in that, in that fire. So that's like, that's something for me that is just a, it, it should just be a non-starter. No one should die because they don't feel like hearing a little beep, right? That's crazy. So um, not only a safety thing, but a, but a maintenance thing as well. Um, you know, we, some of these things, again, they're not aesthetically pleasing. They're not, um, they're not tenants are a little bit sad that you do these things, but it can help. Oh, it's, it's going to be a minor inconvenience. So for example, I don't like the pop-up drain plugs, whether it's in a bathtub or in a sink, 
because all of the mechanics that are required to make that thing pop up are all right there under the sink and they get jammed up by hair and other junk that gets caught in it, right? So often we'll go in and we won't have a, a sink stopper. It'll just be a little rubber plug that you can put in if you wanna stop up the, the sink. And that's just a goofy little one, but, and that actually costs you less than putting a pop-up one in, but it's gonna save you maintenance down the road. Okay, you just saved me a few dollars on a, yeah. on a turnover I'm doing right now. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and you know, same thing goes for the bathtub, right? Like even the ones on the wall or on the, uh, on the side of the tub, all that linkage that's required to make that happen is a, is a spot for hair and other stuff and other junk to get caught. So you still need the overflow, but you don't need that whole linkage system. You can just put a cap on there that is just a passive uh, overflow and you can just have a rubber plug that goes in the, in the bottom. So uh, another thing you have on here is remove all storm doors. And I think I know yes. why, but can you talk about that? Cause most of us, I think have storm doors. Yeah. So storm doors, I get calls all the time where they are so hard to get to latch right, to get them to align properly. And you can even, even if you get it to work perfectly, it can get tweaked. And then now it doesn't latch anymore. And a strong wind comes by and just blows the thing open and either breaks it or put, uh, ruins the piston or whatever. And now you've got to go replace that, that door. Or they, they want to leave it propped open and it starts flapping around in the wind. And it's, it's, I, I learned very early to just take them off because they're not, they're not worth it. Yeah. I actually just recently wanted to take one off that was broken and my mm -hmm. contractor convinced me to put a new one on saying that it's more energy efficient and, and that kind of thing. So yeah, I, from now on, I won't be putting them on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And again, right. Like that's a nice little feature. People might want to leave the door open and have that big glass door that lets the light in and that's all great, but it's, it could end up costing you a lot of money when that thing breaks. Exactly. So yeah. I've actually had tenants that have asked for them. And I say, that's fine. Go ahead and put it on. You're in charge of putting it on. And if it breaks, you have to replace it. I don't own it. Yeah, I think that's a perfect policy. And that's fine. Yeah. Um, because again, they they just break. So so the 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 third part of the um of the list you've created is to reduce t uh, turnover costs. And yep. this can be uh, for your for you newer landlords out there, I don't think people um, realize how much a turnover can be, even with a with a pretty good tenant, um, yeah. because you need to be able to when you're going to show it to 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 new tenants or to new ap applicants, you need the the unit to appear clean and fresh, and you know not like somebody just uh, just moved out and and uh, I mean there's a there's a lot of uh, considerations depending on where you are and what kind of uh, tenant you're seeking to get. But no matter what, a turnover can can be very costly, even even when the house looks like it's in good shape. Yeah, absolutely. So a couple of things here. My favorite one is uh, granite countertops or stone of some sort countertops. Um, you know, everyone says, why why would I pay more on this cheaper rental? why don't I just leave the Formica or put in a new Formica? Because if you, if you understand what that's made of, it's basically got a vinyl layer over the top and underneath is particle board. And when particle board gets wet, it swells. So if you've ever been into a lot of these units, you'll see that the, the end cap always falls off, right? right? It's just glued on there. It always falls off. And then water gets all over, you know, they want to wash the baby or something in the bathtub, you know, the countertop bathtub. And I don't know if you have kids, but, um, you know, when babies are in those little bathtubs, they splash everywhere. Right. So water is going to get into that, into that countertop sooner or later and swell and become useless. Whereas the granite countertop for a level one color is usually only about 50% more expensive. So I all the time put in a granite countertop because that thing's not going to break. Right. That's going to last gonna, you for, you forever. Gonna, it'll last you forever. It's net and and oh, by the way, that's actually an aesthetic that people like. So why not upgrade the unit a little bit and get some more durability out of it at the same time? 
Okay. I like that one. Can you talk a little bit about paint? Because that's a subject that it's like, seems like an endless debate among yep. people. Yeah. So I don't like to use the, the cheapest Glidden paint that's on the shelf. Cause at the end of the day, I, I feel like I always had to repaint units when it seemed stupid. Like I shouldn't have to go and repaint my unit every time for a couple of scuff marks because it should, it shouldn't come through. So we, we, at least try to convince our clients to go with a higher level paint, usually an eggshell finish, which is a little bit closer to um, to like a gloss finish. Again, it's not as aesthetically pleasing because you're gonna get a little bit more shine off of the wall, but it's easier to wipe off when the tenant moves out. You can go in there with a with a bucket and a rag and wipe it wipe it all down. That is way cheaper than going and repainting the whole unit. So, I'd rather spend more money on the paint up front and get a uh, get a shiny, a slightly shinier finish uh, that might not look quite as good, but it's much easier to clean. And what do you say to people who want to do all kinds of colors? One color in every unit, always. Okay. I, I use I use the exact same agreeable gray paint in every one of my units, and I try to convince my clients to do the same. And I keep a five gallon bucket of it in the basement so that when they move out, I can wipe down the wall, do any touch ups I need, and we're right back to square one. Okay. And please don't let your tenants paint your units. Don't nope. let them mm -hmm. give one wall a color because of whatever reasons they have. And they promise they'll put it back to the original color. Just nope. don't. Because <laughs> they won't. They won't put it back to the original color. And you're not going to know how much to charge them to, to get it back there. And they're going to use a, a bright red that you're going to have to go put a, a heavy primer on and then three coat it so that you don't see it anymore. And it's, and it's a, it's a disaster. Don't, don't let tenants paint your walls. So, so this is, uh, this is not, we didn't go over the full list. And like I said, we'll put it in the show notes and it, these are like really, really important tips that are going to help yeah. each one of you out there. I'm sure there's things on here that even the most savvy of you, most experienced have not thought of. Um, right. So we really appreciate that rich. And just to, let's try to lighten the mood a little bit. I think you told me that there was a funny story you had about a hoarder, a, a hoarder house. <laughs> hoarder houses are so fun. I, I love, like, <laughs> people, people laugh at me when I say that, but there's always something interesting in a hoarder house. So one, uh, one property that we bought, uh, it was this older gentleman and, you know, he moved out and we bought it through a wholesaler. And of course, part of the deal was we had to clean it out. And so... As we're going through there, we saw boxes and boxes of 70s and 80s porno VHSs. <laughs> that was so funny to go through some of those videos because like, I didn't watch them, but just looking at the titles and all this stuff, it was hilarious. My contractor and I were just sitting there cracking up. And in the same unit, this guy had 10 cases of 50 pound, uh, 10 50 pound cases of homemade ammunition for, I want to say it was, uh, I, I don't know, I don't know the gauge that it was, but we had to call the local sheriff department and have them come get rid of it for us. And that was just like, uh, wow, that's a, I, I've never seen that again. Let's put it that way. Yeah. This, this is an aspect of, of being a landlord that I would have never, you know, before getting into this game, never had thought about or, or, but it's an, <laughs> something yeah. that we'll come to. But yeah, there's some interesting things you find in houses. That's for sure. Oh, for sure. <laughs> so I've got two. I've got two more quick things I want to say about uh, reducing your turnover costs. Um, two little quick, easy things to do. First one is to, with every tenant that moves in, give them a big pack of command strips, so that they don't start poking holes in the walls where they want to put pictures. Command, it, what did you call it? Command strips. It's the little, they're the, I think it's made by 3M. Um, it's it's a little piece that it's a double-sided tape basically, but it's got this tab on it that when you go to pull it off, you can just pull this tab out and it makes it not sticky anymore. The picture falls off the wall, you're done. So that there's no, there's no holes in the walls. Those are like, those are awesome. Okay. And make sure that they know to, to have the little tab sticking out just a little bit so that you can pull it out later. Um, because if they go to yank it off the wall, it will pull the paint off the wall if you use them or if you just yank them. But um, 
they are uh, they're very helpful. So you don't have to put holes in the walls anymore. Um, and then the last thing is in your leases, I like to try and go through and put a dollar amount for every repair that'll have to be made uh, at, at move out. Um, so every hole in the wall is $5 or like every pinhole is $5. Every uh, doorknob that's broken is $20. Every whatever, go through and try to make as comprehensive of a list as possible so that when they do move out and these things are broken and you have to have that battle over the security deposit, now it's all written up front and right. there's no questions about it. Yeah. And it also so, puts it into their mind from the beginning. Like yeah. if I do this, this is going to cost me. I have to take that into consideration. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Exactly. So okay. yeah, I hope all this was helpful. And if you this, do have more questions, I know, I know Cheryl's going to give you ways to put get in touch with me. Yes, definitely. This was tremendous. I really appreciate it. I'm sure that people are going to find this really, really useful. And, um, and, and, and I think people are going to want to reach back out to you for more information. So how, so. how should they get in touch with you? Um, we'll also include it in the show notes, but just if you can say how, how people can reach you. Yeah. So I'm a member of the Facebook group. Um, you can find my Facebook, uh, in there. If you just go through the members, uh, Richard O'Neill is my name in there. Um, I'm active on bigger pockets. My email is rich at flemingpm.com. Um, and those are probably the best ways. Uh, so if you have any, any questions, feel free to reach out. Okay. And, um, hopefully we'll be able to do another podcast, uh, again soon. Cause there's so many topics that we can just do a deep dive into. <laughs> so many. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'm looking forward to those. Okay. Thank you, Rich. And we'll talk to you again soon. I hope. Great. Thanks, Cheryl.